liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. Oh boy, okay. Hey, good morning everybody. How you doing? It's Thursday, August 18th, 2022. Time for another Thursday, which may be the last of the August Thursdays I was explaining uh, in this morning's post. But you know, we might even uh, be interrupted in that. Do you remember, you know, Thursday has been terrible in August for some reason for the show. Uh, it went off without a hitch last week, but we were concerned that the roofers might show up in the middle of the show and start knocking around and banging on the roof and you can't really stop them and ask them to wait until later when they when they get here they get here except guess what they didn't come during the show and that was fine as far as the show went except that it turns out that they actually said oh we meant next thursday so now we have the same situation today and not only that uh we have the same situation but without the backup last week we had production staff take not days off from work, but do uh, some work from home days, an extra one last week. So that, up oh, and there we go. There's the doorbell. And so, okay, this should be really interesting. Uh, I'm not certain how we're going to handle this, as a matter of fact. And I think what I might have to do for the moment is play some of my interlude music or my intro music, because it's royalty free, and go answer the door. I'll be right back. No, seriously, I have to do this. Well, isn't that exciting? How'd you enjoy the music? <laughs> Did everybody get up and leave? What a thing to have happen, of course, uh, well, on any day. Uh, but now, of course, there might be people listening who are at Netroots Nation this week, because that's going on. It's been some time since I've been able to visit uh, with everybody. And, of course, COVID canceled one or two or 10 or 15 of my lost track of time, just as the roofers have. And they're going to be, oh, there's a floor in between us and the roof, but we're like right under one floor down under where they'll be climbing and banging around so it should be an exciting time for everyone and i'm sure some things will have to move around on the uh on the patio or on the deck as well so that they have uh, access to put a ladder oh who knows what's going to be going on uh well we'll see they may knock on the back door and ask for uh, help or permission to move all the furniture around okay well we'll see what happens um at any rate i was going to say it may be the case that we may find ourselves interrupted again next week. And uh, that might be about the first day of public schools opening up again. And they're monkeying around with the times of the opening of the school and the bus pickup time. So there's a pretty good chance on day one with a weird schedule being implemented that uh, our, our remaining high schooler on the production staff just plain misses the bus. And either has to be sent packing and say, you're walking today, which is possible, but uh, quite a drag. And who knows what the temperature is going to be. Or it's going to have to be me picking up uh, and doing the same thing. Uh, but if I guess if Greg's around, I could have him read the phone book for a while. I don't know. At any rate, uh, asparagus zucchini has enjoyed the uh, nice classical guitar interruption. Well, it's all I had on hand. B back in the olden, olden days, I had those uh, fake commercials that uh, Crashing Vore had put together for us. Does everybody remember those? Oh, they were nice, and they're still around, too. I should just uh, pull one of those out every once in a while. 
they were all uh, for uh, the 2008 or 2012 election uh, targeting Mitt Romney for the most part. So that would be a nice blast from the past, uh, except they only last a minute or two. And who knows how long the blast from the future is going to last on the roof. Anyway, Greg's here. There's probably no roofing going on at your place today. Garbage was picked up yesterday. So, you know, we're in the clear. Good morning, Greg. Good morning. So, you know, uh, Abby weird. still has uh, this thing about people who drive up and down the street without a permission or asking mm, first. Yes. So, you know, rules are rules. You got to follow the rules. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, Merrick Garland comes in and indicts you. Right. And you can't have that. Not without, uh, I don't know, I guess, complaining to the uh, appeals courts. It's difficult for dogs. A lot of things. You got All the lawyers are saying, no, I won't represent the dog. It's it's outrageous. Right. You know, it's 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 hard, you know, but we'll we'll muddle through somehow. Okay. So I, I thought you should uh, simply leave a note on the roof that just says bang <laughs> quietly. That's right. <laughs> Here's the hole. Fix this. Yeah. I mean, I don't yeah. know what they're going to do. They may. I, I'm uh, afraid push again. instead of bang. Right. Yeah. It's just It'll gently coax thumbs, the better nail the into place. But yes, there's really no need for violence. Yeah, well, that's right. what I always say. See there's how no need goes. for violence, and that's really the whole theme of uh, America these days, right? Ah, yes, that's brought us back to the topic. Okay. You know, I was, I was, uh, I started off the stuff I sent you with this observation from Edward Luce, which he made a few days ago. I've covered extremism and violent ideologies around the world over my career, and I've never come across a political force more nihilistic, dangerous, and contemptible than today's Republicans. Nothing hmm. close. Which was interesting in and of itself. Yeah. But what was really yeah, interesting is it was uh, uh, quote tweeted and forwarded by General Michael Hayden, and who said, mm. "I agree." And yep. I was the CIA director. Yeah. Wow. So I mean, he would have seen certainly would have seen all the most nihilistic of nihilism from other uh, parties around the world, not necessarily political parties, but parties to our shared international. Uh, space and right. uh, that would include like ISIS. And yeah, for example. Al-Qaeda. So uh, Jesse Ferguson tweeted around the new national uh, survey, Navigator Survey, strong support for the Inflation Reduction Act overall plus thirty nine, sixty five twenty six, Independence plus forty one, sixty four twenty three, mm-hmm. Hispanic vote plus fifty, seventy twenty. So, you know, these are a few lightning round things uh, before we get into whatever it is we're going to wind up talking about, which I don't know yet. But I did want to uh, hone in a little bit more about Alaska. We'll talk plenty about, you know, Wyoming because Liz Cheney and there's a lot of stuff always to say about Liz Cheney. But I maintain that Alaska was the interesting election on Tuesday, which, of course, isn't over. Yeah. For Wyoming, we could just have everybody in Wyoming on as guests. You may uh, not know this, but Liz Cheney lost her primary. If you turned on the news, they perhaps might have covered it every hour. I did not realize this. For 24 hours. Uh, But uh, in Alaska, there were two elections for the at-large seat. Mm, Uh, Don Young died, and so it has to be filled. So you fill it from now until January. And then uh, there's a November election, and you have to pick who's going to be running in the November election. And it's all the same people in those two distinct elections that took place next to each other with ranked choice voting for the first time. But but is the ranked choice voting is only for one of the elections? The second, yeah, of the two? Okay. yeah. The, <laughs> so the ranked choice voting is only time. for the special then, now. Yeah. Oh, the other was simply to pick who's going to run in November, and then when they have uh, that one in November, then they'll have then they'll okay. have ranked choice That's voting. There. So we know so, who's going to run in November. It's uh, Mary Peltola, the Democrat, who's uh, uh, indigenous right. native of yeah. Alaska. Sarah Palin and Nick Begich and the uh, with 82% of the vote in, Peltola has 35.2%, Sarah Palin has 31.1%, and Begich has 26.8%. Begich, mm. despite his name, is a Republican and represents the more Begich. the traditional uh, Republican Party that Sarah Palin ousted, so Begich people don't like Palin people and vice versa. Mm. Nonetheless, Peltola is slightly in the lead, but all three will run in November, so it doesn't really matter who's in the lead. Okay, so short the term. same people are running in the special. Yeah, they were running this already. Does Why not keep going? does involve ranked voting, and there's a slightly different vote count for reasons that are bizarre, but there it is. Fraud! I'm You'd think it, it would be the same as the other, but no. 
Mary Peltola huh. in the special oh, has 38 percent of the vote. Sarah Palin, 31.9. So a slightly larger lead for the Democrat and Begich with 28. Huh. Okay. okay. This is for, for the special. Election. This is for the special that will okay. use ranked voting. So, again, I told you, the Alaska thing is a lot more interesting. Yeah. So what happens sort of. now, I mean, they're not even going to start rank crazy. voting until all the um, absentee ballots come in, and they're not due until the end of the month. Oh, boy. So you're, you're not going to count. Time to serve you're not going to get to know what happens with rank voting until the beginning of September. And that's when, in the beginning of September, the baggage people who do not like Palin – we get to see whether or not they voted for Mary Peltola or voted nobody huh. or okay. voted for Sarah Palin. We don't know that. So here are two observations from people who have been following this. Uh, one is a fellow named uh, John Samuelson, who's just uh, your general election nerd, you know, who huh. just follows these things and always has interesting things to say. Getting more bullish on Peltola's chances to win in the Alaska special election. Why? With the lead she has, 38%. She doesn't need to win more than a third of Begich's votes. Every write-in or Begich vote that only filled the first choice but didn't fill ah, the second choice man, people aren't is a half vote yet. for Peltola. I originally expected she'd need about 41 in the first round to have a shot, but looking at the 2018 main house race, where they also had ranked voting, expect a good number mm. of votes to be what they call exhausted. So they are used to it. Okay. We're exhausted. Every exhausted vote is a vote that Palin needs to catch up, and the write-in's likely favor Peltola anyway. So hmm. that's his view. But here's an Alaska local reporter. Always follow local reporters if you want to know what's going on. Yeah, that's that hurts right. They'll get upset. A quick thread. And by the way, I have some friends in Alaska. Check with them. They agree with this sort of analysis. A quick thread on where Alaska's ranked choice election for U.S. House stands with Democrat Mary Peltola currently leading Republican Sarah Palin in the first round of ballot counting, but with a lot of questions about how the rest of the counting will go. First, it's going to be a while before we find out Alaska has a longstanding law that allows overseas absentee ballots to arrive and be counted until two weeks after the election. That would be August 30th. Sure. Man, the way ranked choice voting works is that after the first round of ballot counting, the candidate with the lowest number of first choice votes is eliminated, eliminated. Yes. All right. And That's their me. second choice no votes. votes are transferred to the remaining candidates okay. because some of the late arriving absentee ballots could change who's in last place. Alaska elections officials have decided not even to do that, hmm. just in case, in the odd chance that Begich passes Palin and it's Palin that's eliminated. Yeah, let's go for that. Right now, Sarah Palin has 49,000 votes, about 9,500 or 6% behind the Democrat, and Republican Nick Begich trails Palin by about 5,000 votes. And not 100% sure, but it seems pretty likely Begich will be eliminated. And then... Election officials will reassign the second choice votes. Out of Begich's 44,000, Palin would need to get 9,500 more second choice votes than Peltola to catch up. Mm -hmm. They're both Republicans, so it makes intuitive sense she'd be able to do that. And if I had to bet, I'd bet that Palin will do it. But a few reasons for caution. Sarah mm -hmm. Palin still has very high negatives in Alaska, even and especially among Republicans. For those who don't know or remember, she basically came to power by taking down one of the most powerful GOP operatives in the state for doing party business on state time. And she also went after Republican legislators after a scandal with close ties to the oil industry. So I mean, a lot of establishment Republicans do not like her. But OK, yeah, she upset the apple cart on corrupt Republicans. What a great right. fight. So that means that some, perhaps many people who ranked Begich first may not have ranked Palin second. They might have ranked only Begich and not bothered mm -hmm. to list the second choice. So they Both could have been voting. like a woman I talked to at an Anchorage polling place yesterday. Longtime Republican said she ranked Begich first and Peltola second. Hmm. Remember, uh, I told you the other day, uh, uh, Peltola and Palin are friends and they get along. Peltola okay. may be a Democrat, this woman said, but she's not Palin. <laughs> <laughs> well, which is true. Yeah, well, she is I mean, a Democrat. Right. And she's she not him. So That's you know, fact check. Uh, Politifact sure. fact would actually uh, give him a you know no Pinocchio. Well, 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 give him one because they always give you something. Right. Furthermore, Palin and Begich have aggressed. Well, because we don't know if she's a Democrat yeah. next month, so you get and two Pinocchios here. We haven't tried tearing off her mask like Scooby Doo and finding right. out that she's actually Versus. Palin. So, and and she would have won if for you meddling <laughs> kids. Furthermore, Palin and Begich have aggressively attacked and criticized each other on the campaign trail, each in hopes they would not be eliminated first. 
meaning Begich himself may have dissuaded some of his diehard supporters from voting for Palin. So mm-hmm. for what it's worth, Palin said she only ranked herself and left the rest of the ballot blank. OK, well, that's to be expected. Begich told me he ranked Palin second and Donald Duck third. <laughs> well, we're going to go now to Donald for his. Well, that, that's not accurate. I could be condemned for not being totally accurate. He oh. wrote in Donald Duck Jr. Oh, <laughs> that well, Alaska Republican Party spent money to try to get the message out. The conservatives should rank all the Republicans. And the slogan was rank the red. But Begich and Palin didn't really broadcast that message. Hmm. And so uh, hard to know. They're going to say this is going to be the reform's fault if Beltola wins, when frankly, the fault would be their own, said John Henry Heckendorn, uh, yeah, an Anchorage right. political consultant who's worked on Peltola's campaign. In the end, I still think Palin's likely to win. Most of the conservative voters I talked Ooh. to yesterday said in spite of the fact they dislike it, they dislike the ranked choice system, they still filled in bubbles for Begich and Palin. But if things don't go that way, the above dynamic may help explain mm-hmm. why. Okay. So at least that's what to watch for, and at least you have some insight into what's going on there. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on it. And then uh, I'm sure if it doesn't go that way, uh, people will yell about fraud and uh, break into the voting machines and sue everybody. Right. And again, as you pointed out the other day, uh, you have to remember Alaskans really, really, really dislike the lower 48. And the fact that Palin left Alaska and lived in Arkansas for a while, even for a week and a half. Is that right? And basically in their in their minds, you know, didn't really stay in Alaska and then is coming back to Alaska just for they don't know why, uh, would be part of the reason that she just isn't running away with this because obviously she has name recognition over the others. Uh, Well, that's true. But, you know, some people recognize her name in a negative light. Yeah, uh, like they do Liz Cheney in Wyoming. Boy, what what an imposition, though, for the people running in this thing. So if you win the special election, you'll go off to the lower 48, come all the way across the country to Washington, D.C., to hang out a little while in between the end of recess and then the next big recess when everybody goes to campaign, and then you go home and do the whole thing over again. And if you win, you got to get back on a plane and come all the way back again. And right. If you lose, uh, you just uh, spent the month sitting in Washington instead of Alaska. And uh, I don't know, but you get to say, I was a congressman once or congressperson once. Yeah, you can you know, it's good for your real estate business. Identify however you like. Yeah. All right. Well, it, it'll be very exciting and we'll make all of Alaska sick of elections. And I wouldn't be surprised if they came out of it saying this ranked choice stuff is stupid only because they were asked to do it three times in a row. And Well, they yeah. And nobody really understood how it worked. So, yeah. you know, when you do it for the first time, there are problems. And uh, at the same but time, they did do it last you know, time. the whole idea is to get people involved. Yeah. And uh, find out what <laughs> people that really be ironic? want. So, you know, there's always that. And it worked out well for us. We got Jared Golden. Of course, the downside of that is we got Jared Golden. But, you know, yes, well, it worked OK in Maine. OK. So, uh, you know, well, we'll see how Alaskans like it. And it's funny that, uh, yeah, I guess there's, well, it, it gets you involved. It makes you think about how you're casting your vote. More people will become involved. And then, but then you throw them a curveball like special elections. And then everybody's like, I, I have to think about too much when I vote. And I had to do it. You know, every other week for these same three people. I'm sick of these guys already. Well, hopefully everyone hangs in there and uh, makes a good choice. And it'd be nice yeah, to I mean, dispatch not, Sarah not, Palin. It's not the voters' for fault or the reformers who put in ranked voting's fault that Don Young died. Uh, right. And, and made they this thought, needed. They thought that everybody would say, uh, I rank that guy. Uh, yeah, but then he died and everybody, uh, I guess he's off the off the menu. Yeah, they so. had to disrank him. Yeah. Well, uh, that is something. I wonder if that, uh, well, someday someone will do a study about how ranked choice voting does when you're replacing a long time incumbent that's been there literally since statehood and, you know, some way back when and uh, ranking between, th- you know, a bunch of, you know, unknowns, although then you have Sarah Palin. And then you have Sarah Palin, right. Well, so, you know, it's loser, really interesting. So. Yeah. Someone anyway, else can write uh, what else is going on? A lot is going on. Of course, today's yeah. the day that the uh, uh, federal magistrate in Florida hmm. uh, gets to review the idea that Trump wants to know who ratted him out. And oh, well, uh, the no. feds want to keep it secret because there's an ongoing criminal investigation. So mm-hmm. we pretty much know how that's going to turn out. But uh, it'll still be interesting. Yeah. And uh, I'm still shaking my head mm, okay, I'll start. over the idea that uh, people in Trump world initially thought and perhaps still think this is really good for Donald Trump. 
Uh, what they mean by that probably is, is Trump can send out hundreds of fundraising emails and scam people, and therefore it's good for him. Okay. But politically, yeah, it's terrible right. for him. Uh, being under investigation, I mean, that was the whole premise of his first race, that you should elect me because the other one's under investigation. Right, for uh, uh, classification, is classified uh, yeah. you know, information Handle, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so uh, to summarize some of this, and, and uh, I'm going to get to at least one article that really you know, sort of had you scratching your head. But this one huh. is David Rothkopf. Do uh, you get your uh, censorship horn out? Oh, yeah, all right. You ready? Uh, no. <laughs> well, let me do some clicking. All okay. right. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Okay. Well, I'll figure out. Uh, what so the this. headline re reads: Dems okay. do big effing deals. Oh, just so. The like GOP it. does fake big dick energy. Oh, yeah. I didn't. Was wondering what, like you did the effing. So what's going to come? And I wasn't prepared for the other one. But okay. Well, you know, we'll live. Well, it doesn't okay. say effing. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well. So. I mean, I could have read it and claimed. Well, I'm just reading the headline. Yeah. Well, that's good. I think we but can I, live but with I that tried one. This Plus, I got I know you have very sensitive ears. Yes. And, all right. Well, okay. Anyway, so Biden Democrats have energy. an impressive list of accomplishments. What? Trump and Republicans don't, so they overcompensate with false swagger. Ah, uh, okay. And you have to remember yes. that that's always the case. Remember, Democrats are always losing, even when they win, and Republicans yeah, yeah, are true. always winning, even when they lose. And that's just in the DNA, and that's the way it goes. Yeah. But uh, this one, this follow up uh, to uh, my segment here article is from The Economist, you know, uh, generally uh, center right uh, conservative leaning uh, publication. Yes. Donald Trump's hold on the Republican Party is unquestionable, and it's putting his acolytes into offices that control elections. And it goes on to tell the story oh, yeah. that we all know that, sure. hey, Carrie Lake and people in Arizona have won their primaries and people like Mastriano have won theirs in Pennsylvania. And, you know, the right. fact that some of these guys are trailing by anywhere between five to ten points is completely ignored. And they talk about the, the Republicans chances of taking the House seem good. They could take the Senate. The undisputed center of this empire of paranoia is Arizona. Hmm. Yes. And uh, okay. all of these people are a threat. And what are we going to do? And oh, my, oh, my. And I always wonder, like, who's the audience for this stuff? Hmm. Who are they writing for? We understand that the uh, like in Wyoming, uh, the Republican Party prefers Trump to anybody else, but they are still only 30 percent of the population. Okay. And the fact that you are wringing your hands over that 30 percent, where have you been? These guys, I you know, 30 uh, percent, uh, you know, uh, 23, 27, depending upon what poll you looked at, uh, didn't want Nixon to resign. Right. Thirty percent of Whoa. the country has always been nuts. They've always been right wing nut jobs. Yes. They've always True. been white supremacists. They've always been the Confederacy shouldn't have lost. George Wallace voters. There's there's always been a strain of that. This is no different. It's everybody else. And these articles always ignore everybody else, I guess, because they want their own conservative candidates to run and they just can't stand the fact that Republican voters don't want them. Hmm. Oh. Which, which is really the underlying uh, lying issue that they just can't deal with. This one from the Washington Post, Trump's dominance in GOP comes into focus, worrying some in the party. Oh, has that happened? I did not know that. OK. Uh, you know, and they're looking at uh, people like Harriet Hageman, you know, nutcases. Oh, yeah, right. Some right, Republican okay. strategists have voiced worries about Trump's influence, fretting he's elevating less electable candidates in crucial races, which is what I just said, yes. you know. Right. And then his, his polarizing presence in the midterms could complicate Republicans' attempts to win back control of Congress. It, it could. The Todd Aiken election. You know, we get all of that. But that's a feature, not a bug. Yes. It's, it's good. You, you should want that. The fact that you guys don't want that is your problem, not my problem. Mm. So I don't have as much issue with this article. And okay. I guess, uh, you know, what it comes down to is this interesting rant that Josh Barrow had. I think we talked about it uh, in passing, but here's the full yes, article. I recall. A rant. Team normal Republicans, stop whining that Democrats won't help you. Your Trump problem is just that. Your problem. Okay. That's pretty straightforward. Right. And uh, you can go with too long, didn't read. It all comes down to that. So, uh, you know, I, I just am reminded that it doesn't really matter that there was a January 6th insurrection. They wanted to hang Mike Pence. Trump committed treason. 
Well, it doesn't oh, matter. Seditious yeah, conspiracy. Well, None yeah, of that matters. Does, but... They're more worried about what if, like, uh, what is his name? Jack Goldsmith arguing with oh. uh, Josh Marshall on Twitter. Oh. I understand that Trump might have done stuff, but boy, this FBI raid is really difficult to deal with. And maybe we're just better off not trying to prosecute that sort of stuff for the good oh. of the country. What is wrong with you? I don't know. That's what not part of what Trump typically... did are you not getting? Uh, you know, Jack Goldsmith is who he is, but that still surprises me a bit for him. I would have thought he would have come down on the other side. As difficult Mona as Chatton it is. Mona wrote a similar thing in the huh? Bulwark uh, yesterday. Who did? Mona Charon. Oh, well. Who's okay. been an anti-Trumper you know, since the get-go. Yeah, but... You know, uh, but like when push comes yeah. to shove, you know, what they're really worried about... Again, they're so fixated on the Republican base. What if the Republican base mm. doesn't react well? They're not going to react well. That's in and of itself not a reason to avoid doing these things. Yeah, in fact, it's, it's a good reason not to indulge it. The exactly. base should be taught you know, that they're going the, to the, lose the, the and downs, lose forever. Because if you don't do it, you're only going to encourage and empower them. Yes. And they always leave that part out of the equation. And so that's why I read articles like in The Economist and, and th what are you trying to say here? I understand that the Republican base is an issue. But uh, yeah. I, I forget who uh, wrote the article. It could have been Milbank. It could have been somebody else. But along the lines of, you know, everybody keeps saying, well, my excuse for not taking on the Republican Party and elected officials itself is because it's their base that's really crazy. Well, uh -huh. they're empowered by Republicans who don't say anything. They're empowered by Republicans who let the base get away with stuff and don't try to leave. They're empowered by people who were afraid to be Liz Cheney. They're empowered by people like Kevin McCarthy. They're empowered by cowards. Yes. Well, uh, and, and guess who the cowards turn out to be? <laughs> the electeds. Yeah, well, not only the electeds, but uh, the, the, uh, the columnists who write stuff about, well, maybe we shouldn't do anything. Pretty cowardly. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P A T R E O N.com makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options, too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. So much, so much to catch up with. Uh, what did we want to do next? No well, uh, the I, there's a couple of interesting Liz Cheney pieces. Uh, and oh, by the way, did you hear she lost in Wyoming? It may not what? have been covered in the news. Uh, everyone in Wyoming has told me every literally every single person has called. It only took 15 minutes. Right. Liz Cheney already has a 2024 strategy, says Ron Brownstein in The Atlantic. To save the Republican Party, the defeated Wyoming representative may first have to destroy it. Oh, well, uh, go ahead. Uh, wasn't that a quote from the Vietnam era? Yeah, but... Uh, the I'll defiant speech from Representative Liz Cheney of Wyoming after her defeat could be reduced to a single message. This is round one. And that's true. She has a lot of money. And again, just like the article from The Economist I was talking about before the break, who is the audience for Liz Cheney running? Is it the Cheney, media? I, I mean, does anybody else really care? Uh, Who's going to vote for her? Uh, I don't know. Republicans well, aren't. In Wyoming, not very many. Democrats uh, aren't. Yeah. I don't know. I think that uh, my guess is the only plausible explanation for running for president at this stage would be attempting to, you know, uh, continue having a, a platform to tell everybody. Yeah, stay in the Donald limelight, Trump raise is. money. And if you run, a, run against Trump and do super PAC stuff, that's great. I don't have any issue yeah. with that at all. In fact, well, I love it. Yes. If that's but, what she means, then I love it. You know, it. she's not Especially she's not in, in my summer. mind a presidential candidate at this particular point in time. I don't care what she says. And I don't care what other people speculate about. Yeah. 
because uh, so, she has no constituency. I'll just write this down. Liz Cheney is a lock for president. Yeah, exactly. Cheney didn't specify how or where she intends to continue the struggle. But Cheney Over dropped there. a big hint when she noted the GOP's founding father, Abraham Lincoln, lost elections for the House and Senate. True. I mean, it didn't and end And then well. she uh, went on a history <laughs> the tour of the Civil War and okay. uh, talked about a lot of interesting battlegrounds you should go visit and uh, always go to Gettysburg because there's a lot to learn there. Oh, yeah. uh, and sure. then uh, I was scratching my head about the rest. All right. Well, Liz Cheney pennies will be in circulation. It's going to be a whole thing in 100 years. You'll see. Right. Uh, here's uh, a well, uh, a blowback part. Uh, this won't. is E.J. Dion writing, uh, why Liz Cheney's defeat will help this Massachusetts Democrat. Uh, and he points out, you know, in, in uh, uh-huh. very blue Massachusetts, uh-huh. Republican governors have a habit of winning. Yes, but, that happens. Uh, Vermont, too. Liz Cheney's landslide makes Republican Party look so extreme, it's easy for the Democrats to rally around their own and say, uh, we're not going there this time. All right. And the question's going to be, well, does that happen elsewhere? Is it not just yes. Maura Healy who's going to be the next governor in Massachusetts, the Democrat? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the Maura the Healy. field was cleared for her and uh, she's running a strong race. We're going to see that in Senate races, too. You know, if you're trying to use what happened in Wyoming to paint Republicans as extremists, you have a leg up because Republicans are extremists and Wyoming exposes it. Okay. So he writes, the most recent beneficiary of Bay State voters' tendency to pick a GOP governor, to keep an eye on the legislator and the economy, as Jim Roosevelt, a longtime Democratic National Committee member, put it, is Charlie Baker. He swept the victory twice, as often mentioned, along with Hogan in uh, Maryland and Phil Scott in Vermont as part of a triumvirate of middle ground GOP political leaders who thrived in the Trump era. But after November, only Scott has a chance of surviving. Neither Baker nor Hogan is running for reelection and Maryland Republicans nominated Dan Cox, a Trump back extremist whom Hogan has denounced. And this opens the way for another Democrat promising to make national waves writer and nonprofit CEO Wes Moore, who is going to win and make him the state's first black governor. Hey, all right. So uh, it's just an example of some of the, uh, you know, uh, results, some of the ripples that mm-hmm. happen when uh, Republicans do, in fact, get to extremists. Yes. So, you know, what's the result of Republicans being so extremist? Well, you know, if it gets a black governor elected in the, in Maryland, that's OK. Yeah, I mean, I'll take it. Right. Right. Why not? Another angle here. Neiman reports. Of course, remember, they're uh, journalists. One reason the January 6th insurrection failed, the press didn't play along. That's because the press was actually in the Capitol and were under siege <laughs> themselves. As, as we said on the show, it's very difficult to say <laughs> both sides when, like, the other side is trying to kill you. Yes. Uh, I hope an interesting exercise just to see if you could have done it. The U.S. should look to Latin America to understand the role the free press plays in stopping a coup. It was never going to work mm. for one simple reason. Trump and his supporters had failed to take the TV stations. In this case, the TV stations ah. means getting hundreds of journalists and dozens of news organizations to stop informing the public about what was going on on January 6th. That's true. They needed to take over the airports. I've been following the hearings on the riot at the Capitol and Trump's attempt to overturn the results. And a recurring thought is wondering how naive the former president and his minions had to be to think they could succeed in the face of independent, relentless and uninterrupted coverage by reporters on the ground. Because a basic condition of any attempt to overthrow a government in recent history is the plotters have to get mass media to either go dark or lie about what is happening. In other words, they have to make yes. the entire country Fox News. And if you can't do that, it's going to fail. Yeah, well, you know, that's in all the movies, right? You're supposed to storm the TV station and go in with a gun and uh, take the, the anchor and drag him out and put your own guy and maybe an army fatigues there or, or right. hide behind the chair and... and Make the guy say, uh, I welcome our new overlords or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Uh, So uh, the author of this piece says, uh, you know, there's another recurring thought. One that came from watching the January 6th hearings from Latin America. I kept thinking of Peru and Guatemala and uh, the playbook that Trump and his advisors were following was written south of the border in a region that has had more authoritarian leaders and lectures in the U.S. about democracy than Mm -hmm. we care to count. (laughs) That's These true. countries experience self-coups, autogolpe, they're called. Ah, right. And in Spanish. Attempts their by their report. presidents to stay in power or increase their power rather than seize it. Watching the hapless attempts by Trump to overturn the results, 
in a legislator that wouldn't bend to his will. I kept thinking about how Alberto Fujimori tried and succeeded in Peru in 92, mm-hmm. and Elias tried and failed in Guatemala in 1993. For a journalist, these are examples of a bygone era that did not have the essential tools of today. No cell phones, email, mm-hmm. chat apps, web pages, or social media. But they're important reminders in the role of an independent press in a democracy. I think you make some very good points here. Yeah, there are. And uh, it's, it's very true and a good lesson on the uh, Latin American angle on all that. And maybe that was it. The playbook was written in Spanish and then they couldn't read it and then it didn't work. Well, so uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, social media and chat rooms and private chats and other things available here in the U.S. Yes. Sarah Posner writing at uh, Talking Points Memo has this piece, The Christian Right Plots How to Avenge the FBI Raid. The Anointed One is Besieged and Themes of War Abound. So she takes a dip in the pool that you want to stick your toe in. You just don't want to go there. A central theme of the Christian Right's coverage is that the raid was politically motivated to stop Trump from running for president again in 2024 and to dampen his influence in the 2022 midterms. Was it driven by politics or national security? Why did we not see the same with Hillary Clinton, said Anthony Perkins. And, uh, you know, I still keep thinking he's that guy in the motel that you shouldn't listen to because he's really creepy. Uh, The day after Attorney General Merrick Garland publicly explained the legal process by which the search warrant was obtained and executed, just the fact that Clinton's home was never the subject of a search warrant was evidence enough that Trump had received unequal treatment. Ah, well... Yeah, okay. And then Tony Perkins even lauded the Trump administration for not investing Clinton because, you know, they didn't want to create a political circus. Uh, Okay. I mean, but they did seize the server. Well, you know, you ever hear the chant locker up? Yes. I I mean, he's just that outlying. Uh, Yeah, I I don't know. And uh, that has become uh, part of the fashion among Republicans to say, well, nothing happened to Hillary Clinton. But they, you know, the FBI did seize the, the server. They just showed up and and the clinton said well rule of law i'll be more cooperative here take i haven't done anything go ahead yeah uh so you know they didn't drag it out if they had well they complied with the subpoena and that was it you know and and again the 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 clintons weren't being cooperative they were being compliant it was a subpoena you know all right come on and take i guess that's what the paper eric uh metaxas a popular evangelical author trump promoter and radio host called the fbi thugs he interviewed charlie kirk founder of the right-wing campus group turning point usa Mm. and also a rising star in the evangelical world who declared the raid a rubicon moment for the left it wasn't a raid it was a military occupation i look at it as a political invasion Stephen Strang, an influential evangelical publisher and author of four laudatory books about Trump, wrote, I believe God raised up Donald Trump and there's warfare going on, (laughs) satanic activity that's trying to tear Mm. down the fabric of this country. He urged Americans who are concerned about religious freedom and the threat of communist agendas in this country to stand up and (laughs) voice their support for President Trump. And the pull quote they have here is on one side is Trump, whom God anointed, on the other are creepy thugs who rummaged through his wife's intimate belongings. Mm. They made a whole thing about, oh, they went into Mar-a-Lago and they went through Melania's stuff. Those yeah. perverts. Uh, sure. Uh, then they found out that some of that stuff was a little odd, too. Probably. Who knows? Anyway, yeah, this is uh, this is this is um, fertile ground for them. They've been here before. I mean, I, I, it's uh, Ruby Ridge to Waco to Alfred P. Murrah. Yeah, you know, just bombing, so you know that stuff's track. going on. And it's fine to know that's going on. But, you know, I'm waiting for the economist to say, oh, look at all this stuff. We have to pay attention to it. It's really uh, scary that all of this is going on because uh, why are we why is it scary? Because we know we're going to fall in line down the road. That's why it's scary. Mm, we can't tell <laughs> that you that, but that's scary. why we're scared. <sighs> well, that that is that is kind of frightening, actually. It is, but, but not for the reasons they think. Right. Well, it doesn't have to be. But uh, Ian uh, Milheiser writes, I think the question of how will suburban voters who favor stability react to the fact that the leader of the GOP is under FBI investigation is a lot more interesting than how will Trump's most rabid supporters react to the investigation. OK. Yes. Right. Because an interesting fact about the U.S. electorate, you know, he points out something I've been saying, I guess, for the oh, last hour. That's why you an like interesting it. fact about the U.S. electorate is that most voters are not proud boys. Ah. You, you probably didn't know that from the mm. way these people get covered. Right. 
Most don't watch Fox News. Most think the January 6th attack was a bad thing. So if somebody insists on making a living as a horse race pundit, maybe they should like consider these voters. Yeah. Why aren't they in diners? Uh, that's the question. Yeah. I mean, right. maybe we should close uh, the diners. Has anybody well, uh, floated One that? of the best polls in the country, <laughs> of course, is uh, Wisconsin Law Poll. Uh, and uh, they had a poll out, I think it was yesterday, showing a 35-year-old candidate uh, working to oust Ron Johnson, Mandela Barnes, yeah. with a seven-point lead. Okay. Good. Okay. I mean, Evers also has a lead, but it's a, it's a little bit smaller. Uh, and they point out that the uh, opponent to Evers, whose name escapes me, uh, Michael, Tinkers. I think his name is, oh, okay. and uh, uh, Mandela Barnes are the candidates who have been on the air. This is Dan Schaefer, a local journalist. Again, you learn things from local journalists writing in the New York Times. Millennials came of age at a time of crisis. They're the first generation in American history positioned to be worse off than their parents. Huh. And Della Barnes, who won the yeah. Democratic Senate primary in Wisconsin on Tuesday night, understands the challenges this era has thrust upon millennials better than most. He's only 35, and if elected, could be only the second senator born in the 1980s. All right. And uh, goes on to say he has the tools he needs to overcome some of his flaws. He can win this race in part because he's endeared himself to mainstream Democrats as a member of the Evers administration, because he may be able to tap into a new pool of Wisconsin voters. And then okay. they talk about how Johnson is, of course, uh, vulnerable. As Jamel Boy wrote recently, the older guard lacks any sense of urgency and crisis in the Democratic Party, any sense that our system's on the brink. Democrats have been delivering legislative wins as of late, uh, but it's been an arduous process to get there, stalled by filibusters and parliamentarians in everyday D.C. gridlock. Mm. Mr. Barnes, for his part, seems to grasp what the old guard does not. He's put eliminating the filibuster front and center in his campaign wow. and has throughout his career talked about the need for Democrats to be bolder in messaging on bread and butter issues. And as a young uh -oh. black millennial from a tough part of a large Midwestern city, he can give voice to issues many in the Senate can't relate to, and he can do it through lived experience. He's the son of a United Johnson Auto Worker, father, a public school teacher, mother, born in a troubled high poverty area, Milwaukee. Uh, and of some of Mr. Barnes' controversies are actually reasons that he may understand where younger voters are coming from. He oh. was delinquent on a property tax payment and had an incomplete college degree. He also drew negative headlines of being on Badger Care, which is Wisconsin's Medicaid <laughs> program. But encountering financial challenges and making some bad? early career mistakes sounds like a typical millennial. Perhaps if more of our elected officials face similar challenges, they'd have a better idea how to help others. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's in a that's a, a theory. Right. And to be fair, plenty of other Democratic candidates are harnessing toast. that kind of rhetoric and energy. I might add, John Fetterman, for example, they quote, ah. "He's doing great." He's you know to the point where uh, Cook Political just said, "You know what? It's not a toss up." Ah. They okay. said that this morning. Wisconsin is more politically complex than it can sometimes appear. The idea that the state can't stomach a politician as progressive as Barnes is pure fiction. Liberal candidates have won 10 of the last 11 statewide elections. Right. Senator Tammy Baldwin was also accused of being far too left when she ran for statewide office a decade ago. And in 2018, she was reelected by almost 11 point margin. Well, that's the way past that gerrymandered legislature is to run statewide. Right. And. While slogans like abolish ICE and defund the police have become unpopular, Black Lives Matter is very popular. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, that's uh, the epicenter of some of the later outbreaks, really. The, the Wisconsin uh, and uh, uh, Minnesota connection there. Anyway, the takes the case for a generational shift. Okay. Uh, I'm ready for that. Let's take it. And yep. Ron Johnson not uh, connecting with the uh, greetings, fellow kids. It's not working. Yeah. Well, he says, you know, I realize people don't like me, but they really need to get to know the real me. Ah. Well, the problem for him is people do know the real you and they don't like you. Well, then they need to get to know the fake him. So that's why he's increased his lead in the polls. Again, uh, the professional uh, election handicappers look at the landscape and say, well, OK, so the Democrats have certainly made some gains. They made some gains in the generic ballot, depending upon who you believe. They either have a small leader. It's tied. The Senate is uh, was leaning Republican. Now it's, you know, tied. Uh, Cook Political says as of today, uh, you know, a plus one Democrat 
versus minus three Democrat, in other words, plus three Republican, is uh, the range that we're looking at here. So it's pretty close to a tie. Uh, 538 says 60 percent chance the Senate stays Democrat, which is, in their view, pretty much a tie. Uh, and, and I think that's the fair landscape. But of course, it's not over and things are happening. And as Republicans continue to be exposed as being too extreme for America, and as uh, the Mar-a-Lago stuff and the Trump stuff happens and they rally around somebody who's clearly flawed, splitting their own party, uh, even if it's a 70-30 split, you can't win if 30 percent of Republicans won't vote for you. That's why, again, uh, we'll see what happens in Alaska with Palin and why she's not a lock. You know, she may pull it out. But then again, it's uh, close. It has it isn't the runaway you'd think with Sarah Palin running with her name recognition. So it's all part of the same sort of theme. And I just don't think Republicans are doing that well. And uh, it's just so ingrained in pundits and analysts to say that Republicans are going to win. It's the natural, uh, you know, uh, state of things. So the idea that Democrats can actually pull out a win and do okay in 2022, we're just not wired to think that. Yes, I see all the information. And yes, okay, fine, grudgingly, okay, maybe it's neutral. But that's about as good as they could do. And then. Uh, you know, they still concentrate on who's in the diners and what are they saying, because yeah. that's who they are. I wonder. It'll be very exciting. So supposing we have all this great outcome, I'm curious what they'll all write about how, you know, I, I assume at that oh point. Oh, my God. Write, women we right women came out to vote and we didn't see it coming. You think? Or will they say we were right all along, just as we said? Uh, well, half of them will do that. Total domination by the Democrats because of exactly the things we didn't actually say. But we were we yeah. were considering saying them, but then we got frightened. Yes. Democrats won because of all the things I was considering writing a column about, but didn't, and therefore I was right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that happens all the time. I usually uh, find myself on some, oh, remember I talked about this in there. You know what? Maybe I never actually said it because I just was thinking about it or tweeting about it or wrote it somewhere else. But No, well, you know, David Brooks will write a column the day after the election, mm-hmm. why the Republicans were doomed before they even started. Right. And it was the FBI raid. That was and it was the FBI for... that did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, why not? Just switch directions. It was that or take because, like, who fancy Italian you know, delis or I don't when know. And you have Applebee's. lifetime appointments to be in a columnist. You don't have to be right or wrong. I guess that's true. I wonder what makes them so popular there at the New York Times. And I wonder what it costs them, too. But I don't know. And, you know, and speaking of uh, columnists who can't get around to thinking that, uh, you know, this is really bad and they can't say so. I think Kathleen Parker had yet another column in the Mm. Washington Post. I, I still don't understand to this day how she wound up winning a Pulitzer. She's like an awful analyst. Ah, fraud. The dueling perceptions of the Trump age. Hmm. What are they? Uh, (laughs) Having federal agents descend on your property is shocking under any circumstances, unless, of course, you're a criminal, in which case you surely wouldn't have been a president of the United States, right? (laughs) Well, Trump might have been both, but what if he isn't a criminal? Isn't it equally possible he's merely stubborn, prideful, and irresponsible? Intent would seem well, to be crucial to the answer. No, Kathleen. He had highly classified material he wasn't supposed to have. Intent has nothing to do with it. The law yes. doesn't say, oh, if I meant well, it's fine. That is correct. Uh, I did see somebody discuss it in a very nice but lengthy video that uh, for those who had a little bit of either criminal justice background or lawyers, it's about as close, uh, especially the, the statute they've been talking about uh, lately, 18 U.S. Code 793E, about as close to a strict liability crime as there is. The documents are there. That's your house. You're under arrest. Right. I've wrestled with both events, she writes, trying to gauge their effect on our politics in a time of deep division. Hmm. The two historic moments are not the same, but they both signal profound disruptions to our values. Neither should happen in America, and yet both did, and arguably Trump is to blame for both. What, oh, I forget what the first one was. But okay. uh, January 6th yeah. and Mar-a-Lago. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Part of me thinks that Mar-a-Lago search couldn't have happened to a nicer guy, but the other part of me... Informed by history's examples of government overreach, finds the search of a former president's home is unsettling. Mm, oh, well, uh, I don't trust the government. Basically, she says, maybe it's just the reporter Fine. in me. These I two guess. episodes are hardly mirror images. They're not anything like each other. No, they're not. I would. Uh, everyone remembers her famous defense, though, of Edward Snowden, right? Yeah. Uh, but he had the documents. Yeah, but but he had good things. He was trying to help uh, just, you know, democracy and transparency. Uh, I'm pretty sure she was, uh, you know, 
hang Edward Snowden type person. Maybe it would surprise me if I looked back on the record, but uh, but like, like we said, it's a strict hardly... liability thing. You can't have that. You can't. Yeah. And you're supposed to know that as president because you're surrounded by people who are supposed to tell you that. And he was. And she he still says did. one was lawful. The other plainly was not. But they don't. Re but they do reflect the dueling perceptions of our time. If you see Trump as the worst excuse for a president, then the search bordered on the mounted cavalry riding to the rescue. Oh, OK. I'm in that camp. Yeah. If this was the government's Al Capone Nuclear strategy, cavalry. the feds couldn't pin racketeering, but so they jailed him for tax evasion. Fine. Get on with it. But All right. if you happen to like Trump, then the search was another piece of a larger picture in which the FBI, the media and Democrats are in cahoots to deprive Trump of power. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, did they I mean, come out of there with documents? You're treating those things as equal? That's ridiculous. But The search yeah, might have been justifiable, she's, she's but the image of a federal agent trampling the sacred grounds of their hero's castle has emboldened Trump supporters as little else could. If the Justice Department intends to indict Trump, it needs that quickly. Otherwise, in the battle of dueling perspectives, Trump might have the lead. F that. That is so yeah, stupid. Well, I am so sick and tired of people saying, okay. oh, well, Trump's winning on this. He's not right. close to winning on this, except for the grift he does by sending out emails to raise money from stupid people who will send it to him. Yes. All right. Really this annoying. Is a righteous rant. And she's I'm supposed to be an did. analyst. Uh, well, you can't spell analyst without the first four letters. On I the guess. one Maybe hand, he did stuff this. he wasn't supposed to, and that's clearly obvious. And on the other hand, his supporters might be upset. So therefore, those are equal <laughs> circumstances we have yeah. to keep in mind when we're trying to judge the political and uh, uh, the the big picture outcome that's yeah. going on right now with this. They, and so I am of divided mind because on the one hand, he did something illegal. And on the other hand, Trump voters might be upset. Right. It, it goes yeah, back to that tough. Economist article. Who is the audience for this crap? Uh, I don't know. I mean, they're not reading the Washington Post, the Trump fans. So it's uh, difficult to know how they're going to get this thing sent to them. And it's I mean, I wonder even whether the editors at the Washington Post. Well, occasionally we have to run one of these things so that people will remember that we're, you know, expressing a balance of viewpoints. But, yeah, I don't know. There's no audience for that at the Washington Post. It, it is ridiculous. That's her job. Well, I they guess, have Mark but... Thiessen and Gary Abernathy if oh. they want. Uh, there's nothing to see here. Move along because that's basically what they write. Well, but they also have her, and they have to keep paying her because of contract or something. Yeah, she's uh, she's pretty terrible, and that's a pretty awful uh, quote unquote analysis because I mean, th just this crime it just doesn't fit for this this thing. And, and of course, the idea of trampling the hallowed halls of uh, the Trump's, thing is you don't know what he did yet. Swinger club. Yeah, well, that, that uh, affidavit's going to stay sealed, and you don't know whether or not he was involved in blackmail. Or selling off this stuff, or That's just had just it to lie. show people. You don't know any yeah. of that. And the lack and of imagination matter. of people who can't imagine that somebody who was a president of the United States mm. would do such a thing. You know, that lack yes. of imagination is, is part of her problem as an analyst. This morning, uh, oh yeah, right, somebody was complaining, as as this happens every morning on my Twitter feed, complaining about Maggie Haberman uh, and her latest, but uh, which sounded like it has a good point. I haven't read the article yet, but generally speaking, saying, uh, well, I can't believe you would write a whole article, the comment was, about the reasons why Trump might have kept that classified material and you don't include among them to make money with them because yeah. that's duh, that's just core Trump. But, you know, yeah, his writers more saying, oh, but that can't really like be. He liked to, you know, he liked to show his friends that he had stuff. OK, yeah, fine. But, you know, use your imagination. What if he were actually involved in something illegal? We don't know that he did. We don't know that he didn't. That's true. But, you but, know, give that stuff time to I develop. To say, but, yeah. Uh, again, bringing Here's it Mona back Charon to Sharon writing in oh, uh, the bar work. Right, preserving <laughs> democracy require letting <laughs> Trump off. It's hard to weigh domestic ah. tranquility against justice. Uh, no, they no, go hand not. in hand. It's, uh, it's you can't easy. have no. You, they, there's an old chant that says no justice, no domestic tranquility. And there's a different word for it that they use, but as I recall, it was a very pithy phrase, and uh, it rang true for a lot of people. No justice, no domestic tranquility. However, uh, yeah, if you just have criminals running around as president, stealing nuclear secrets, and maybe giving them out to people, maybe not. I don't know, but. Uh, that's that's difficult to countenance. And and again, back to the concept of strict liability crime, the designers of the statute wrote it the way they wrote it because it doesn't matter what you 
intended to do with it. The assumption is that if you have that material, you are going to lie when you're caught about why you have it. I was doing it to strengthen America. Well, nobody really believes that. And it's a big pain in the butt to, to prove that, but it's also extremely dangerous for people to have it. So it's simply going to be, if it's in your possession and it's not supposed to be, you're under arrest. But I was going to give it to God. Well, will indict him when he shows up. But in the meantime, you're under arrest. It it just, that's the way it's designed because you never know. And the people who steal the stuff are liars. So, you know, you know, so who cares? It's just crazy stuff. If Mandela Barnes is evident of a younger generation coming in to do politics, and that's great, what we need is uh, a new generation of columnists, I think, because some of these older columnists are, you know, ugh, yeah, cr- cringe. Uh, yes. Okay. I'll do it. Give me the work. I'll uh, write you a column. I don't know. We make two hours of nothing up every day. So I think we could probably do it. Yep. Anyway. And of course, uh, I'll end with the, uh, the, the biggest news today so far. Okay. Uh, the price of chicken wings is coming down (laughs) in time for football season. Yes. Uh, as far as I can tell, the rest of the chicken has not been polled. (laughs) <laughs> that's right you rarely ask you they, you know only 20 percent of respondents were chickens or identified as chickens yeah. so obviously well okay so the price is coming down that's good uh chicken wings belong in crudite oh gas prices are concerned. coming down too yes but uh, Great. i don't know that uh that chicken wings go nope. in uh, veggie trays uh i would put them there i mean cause, uh, salsa doesn't either but you know what's the difference put whatever you want in there gasoline could be in i mean you know if i want I grew up in a not wealthy house, you know, so to me, I understand Crude that potatoes are a green vegetable. That I get. Uh, but well, once uh, they chicken turn wings, green, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, ketchup, uh, I learned from Ronald Reagan, is a vegetable. So maybe chicken wings is two. And uh, if anybody ever develops a car that runs on chicken wings, we'll really, you know, then we'll finally be in good shape here. Okay. Because the price is coming down. That's what everyone was looking at. And, uh, and that's what everybody that's wants. New. Yeah. And, uh,. I assume that there's surplus rest of the chicken out there somewhere as well. All right. Well, good luck with your roof. And, Thank you. Uh, we'll see what's going on on Monday, whether okay. or not uh, your house is livable. And, you know. Yes. Right. And uh, see if the price of uh, drumsticks and gizzards catch up. Important to know. Thanks, Greg. We'll catch up with you next week. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I haven't heard any banging and hammering just yet. I'm not certain what's going on, but uh, I shouldn't wish it on myself. All right, let's see. To continue on this theme, because there is no other news apparently, I've got a couple of pieces to share. Uh, well, at least I'll share part of this one from The Bulwark. Not something I usually read. Happened to just see it go by on Twitter. It had a nice illustration with it, so it caught my eye. It's Amanda Carpenter, who I, you know, whatever. But, uh, okay, she, you know, occasionally contributes something of interest uh, as an anti-Trumper out there. So, uh, but this piece is something she sent around saying, I say this is a Liz Cheney fan, but shut down the Cheney 2024 chatter. What would a conservative type person be saying that for? It will distract from her important work on the House January 6th committee. Interesting. I don't know if it's a huge problem, but it looks to be a relatively short piece. Let's see what she has to say here. And then uh, throw her back. Anyway, let's stipulate up front that I am a huge fan of Liz Cheney. That's uh, all you. You can go ahead. Uh, Let's see. And uh, I agree with her that Republicans cannot be both loyal to Donald Trump and loyal to the Constitution. I am deeply thankful for her courageous efforts to hold accountable those who enabled the attack on our democracy on January 6th. And I would most likely happily support her in any future political endeavors. But. This is not the time to play into the 2024 presidential feeding frenzy. I think she may accommodate you in this, too, uh, and simply concentrate on her work on the committee until that comes to an end. And then if she's, uh, you know, let's say less than serious about necessarily landing herself in the Oval Office after the 2024 elections and more intent instead on campaigning against Donald Trump, I think she can do it that way. Wrap up her work on the committee and then... You know, at that point, it's only 2023. So she's got plenty of time to then go foil Trump later. So I'm not too worried. But anyway, okay, you don't want both happening at the same time. 
All right. The correspondents and columnists and commentators are undoubtedly doing their best to bait her into it. All the big name reporters camped out in Wyoming on Tuesday, not to watch her lose, but to build their 2024 storylines. Maybe, possibly. I also understand, by the way, that uh, Kevin McCarthy was there in Wyoming on Tuesday having a having a defeat Liz Cheney party, apparently. That seems kind of weird. Uh, I know about it. Um, or I, I know that it's been alleged that that's the case because someone was tweeting around today that Elon Musk was apparently there, even though he asked, they begged everybody not to tell anyone that he was there, which is weird all by itself. The fact that there was such a party is weird also all by itself. Two of those things together. But apparently the story leaked because uh, nobody could help themselves uh, or stop themselves from taking selfies with Elon Musk and then tweeting it out. And so I guess it blew his cover if anybody really believed that that had been kept under wraps. Anyway, where was I here? Oh, all the big name reporters were in Wyoming. Maybe they went to the party. I don't know. Just to cover it, of course. And uh, let's see. And she whetted their appetites, the ones who were there to build up their 2024 storylines, with an announcement shortly after her loss that she converted her campaign committee to a leadership pack named The Great Task to oppose any Donald Trump campaign for president. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, The cable shows went into overdrive, speculating about what's next for Cheney and demanding answers from her backers about her likely strategy to win the GOP nomination, which she may not actually have. None of this is helpful, even if she does want to run for president. Moreover, it is counterproductive to the great task immediately at hand, finishing her work as leader of the House January 6th committee. A leader. That's that's correct. A leader. Because once someone becomes a presidential candidate or is known even to be exploring a bid, the media reduces every one of her actions to a bare-knuckled political calculation. I think that's fair. Which is exactly what the January 6th committee, where Cheney has said she is doing her life's most important work, doesn't need. Okay, fair point, I think. Uh, There's more. Let's see if it's any better. As co-chair of the committee, Cheney has done more to explain and focus the nation on what Trump did. He... Quote, summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack more than than anyone on the national stage. And the committee has much still to do in the months ahead, but the moment she's viewed as a candidate rather than a co-chair of the committee, she'll be chased through the halls of Congress with inane questions about fundraising, polls, strategy, staff, and outrage of the day minutia. People will quit caring about what she's saying and start judging what she's wearing and evaluating her likability. Or worse, they will cast doubt on whether she is co-leading the committee with integrity or steering it toward conclusions intended to further her political ambitions. Maybe. Or people just won't give a crap. But whatever. If Cheney wants to be a presidential candidate or mount another effort to defeat Trump in 2024, she should. Later. Those questions should be decisively, definitively deferred until she has packed up her congressional office. The unfortunate thing, of course, is it's impossible to do. Like, you could say, look... I might run. I might not. I won't lie to you. It's a possibility, but I'm not going to do anything or make any moves towards it until 2023. I have a job to finish here and that's that. And then people will still bother her about it and still write columns about how she needs to be more definitive about things. And uh, I don't know what you do about the fact that people are chasing you around saying, are you running for president? And you say, no, at least not now. And 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 people just continue to pretend you said yes or really meant it or right. She's running and uh, go with that. So not too much she can do about it. Mm. Not that I care. It's her problem. Uh, her time in Congress will end quickly enough. Besides, the press already considers her a national figure. Cheney gains nothing by teasing a presidential run, if that's what she even did, and subjecting herself to endless 2024 inquiries. Her final days in Wy- as Wyoming's representatives, representative and, you know, the old, the only one should be wholly dedicated to putting the final touches on the January 6th committee report, issuing recommendations to Congress and doing all she can to inform the public of the committee's findings. If done well, Cheney's work on the January 6th committee will be her guaranteed legacy. Can that also serve as the foundation for something to build upon in the future? Perhaps. But both purposes cannot be openly served at once. They are, there's, apparently there's nothing open necessarily about it, but... Maybe. I don't know. Cheney gave up her congressional career to pursue the truth of what happened on January 6th. Any talk about 2024 at the moment only risks obscuring the sacrifice. And I don't really know whether that was even necessary to do because she maybe that uh, Cheney herself is saying just 
That's not what I'm talking about right now. But now writing articles that say that shouldn't be what you're talking about because all of this other stuff, I mean, I don't know. I think this just actually adds to the the problem that Carpenter is trying to identify. But okay, whatever. Uh, let me move on, though, because uh, I grabbed something via Twitter today that's actually from Digby writing in Salon, so where she's got her full name there, Heather Digby Parton, and not just Digby in the old blog sense, but uh, same person, of course. And when she writes formally, we have to read out the whole name. Uh, I thought this was an interesting headline. It actually made me think she was talking about something slightly different, which is great because then I get to talk about something slightly different, not just read you the article. Enough politics before law. The U.S. must abandon presidential privilege and prosecute Donald Trump. Okay, certainly a, a prospect we can all get behind. Um, what I think she's driving at here is, uh, you know, what she says the word you invokes the word privilege. I read it in a different way. Uh, we must abandon presidential privilege and prosecute Donald Trump. She was saying, yeah, this idea that uh, presidents are. Okay, if not exactly above the law, then certainly uh, existing in a weird outside the law sort of uh, 180 degrees out of phase with the law uh, as it applies to everybody else. And only rarely, only very rarely do you actually apply the law to a president or even ex-president. This is the sort of thing that, uh, well, the two idiots we were talking about before, Mona Charon and Kathleen Parker were talking about, that it somehow disturbs and upsets people, even not necessarily Trump's biggest fans, that, uh, well, the ex-president's home was uh, searched with the search warrant and how disturbing that is. And what's really disturbing about it is the, pro the, the fact that it had to be done is what should be disturbing you, except you're turning that into, well, now I don't even think that there was really reason to do it, except there was. They got out of there with boxes of classified material, some of which apparently pertain to nuclear weapons, and that's it. Case closed. Like I said, strict liability. Does everybody even know what that that means? I mean, if you didn't go to law school, maybe you don't. Um, but uh, let me see if I can get you a uh, a a, a um, quick definition here from uh, oh from the the people who uh, provide us the nicely uh, formatted U.S. code over at Cornell Law School. Strict liability. Let me just grab that. Uh, entry that they have here. Strict liability, which contrasts with general intent and specific intent, they note parenthetically, in both tort and criminal law. That is, so does everyone know even what tort is? Tort, like personal, uh, well, uh, uh, civil lawsuits when one person uh, uh, commits an, or inflicts an injury upon another, not a uh, physical injury necessarily, but, you know, does some damage to you economically or otherwise. In both tort and criminal law, strict liability exists when a defendant is liable for committing an action regardless of what his or her intent or mental state was when committing the action. Regardless. Well, he didn't intend to. Well, it doesn't matter. It is a strict liability issue. The end. You have done it. I did it for God. Great. You can pray in prison about it because you are guilty it, regardless of what his or her intent or mental state was when committing the action and by the way that's a separate issue from the fact that we are learning uh over the past couple of days that the classification status of the documents also don't matter the law says if it's got national defense information strategic national defense information in it classified or not there's no mention of the word classified in the statute that's a problem. You fall under the statute if uh, uh, strategic defense information is in there. And if you've got it, it's a strict liability issue. Don't care how you got it. Don't care why you got it. Don't care what you meant to do with it. It's in your hands. And that's, you know, that was intentionally done. Why? Because one, we can't always prove anything. And two, we can't have it be like, well, I'll steal these documents and give them to the Soviets back in the day, right? And then they arrest you before you meet your shadowy connection in a back alley or a parking garage or whatever and give away the secrets. If they arrest you beforehand, they don't want anybody saying, well, I never actually gave it to the Soviets. No harm, no foul. What do you say? 
uh, we all go. And I, after all, I can say I never intended to give it to the Soviets. I meant to give it to someone fun and friendly. Uh, or Israel. Ask Jonathan Pollard whether that helped him. It did not. Um, at any rate, uh, so yeah, if you've got it, that's all there is to it. They don't want to wait around for you to give that stuff away. And they don't want to give you the excuse of, well, I failed in my mission ultimately, and so therefore you can't charge me. If you took it, there's no good reason for you to have it. So the end. So again, back to strict liability, just so you all know. Uh, it exists when a defendant is liable for committing an action regardless of what his or her mental intent or mental state was when committing the action. In criminal law, possession crimes and statutory rape are both examples of strict liability offenses. Ironically, both things which should have caused search warrants to be served at Pervalago over the years, and yet only one has manifested itself at this point even though they had good probable cause for the statutory rape issue as well. Never mind that. Strict liability as applied to criminal law is treated in the next brief section. In criminal law, strict liability is generally limited to minor offenses because it's, you know, generally speaking, difficult to uh, uh, um, rationalize under our system of justice that uh, there's really no consideration of other factors. Well, that's easier to contemplate when you're talking about minor offenses and therefore minor punishments going along with it. But it's not always the case. Criminal law classifies strict liability as one of five possible, ready for this one? You remember the, the, the term, except now we're talking about the uh, plural of the term. Five possible mentes rea, that is a mens rea in a bunch. A bunch of mens reas are mentes rea, I guess, R-E-A-E, rea, rea, I don't know. I don't know about the pronunciation there, but anyway, like I said, uh, criminal law classified strict liability is one of five possible mental states that a defendant may have in pursuit of the crime. The other four are acting knowingly, acting purposely, acting with, with recklessness, and acting with negligence. The mens rea of strict liability typically results in more lenient punishments than the other four mentes rea. Typically in criminal law, the defendant's awareness of what he is doing would not negate strict liability mens rea. For example, being in possession, not of national security secrets, but in this case, let's say being in possession of drugs, will typically result in criminal liability, regardless of whether the defendant knows that he is in possession of the drugs. And guess who the big fans of strict liability for drug possession are? Well, they're all the people who say, why should this be criminal if Donald Trump actually has this national security information? Just because there's strict liability for this, it's not going to hurt anyone. He didn't give it to anybody. Yeah, well, same thing about the drugs. But you can easily imagine and you often do imagine the things that those people will, those people will do with the drugs. Uh, it really takes no stretch of the imagination to say the same about nuclear secrets, but apparently they're incapable of doing it. Strict liability is applied to tort law is, well, a different thing we don't really have to deal with because this isn't a tort case. There's controversy. The classification of strict liability has not been without controversy. Some scholars oppose the concept the entire concept for reasons commonly related to the unfairness of a defendant being held liable for something unrelated to the defendant's intentions or lack thereof. Others support the classification with some reasoning that the more lenient punishments, which accompany strict liability offenses sometimes mitigate the potential unfairness related to the classification. There's more reading you could do. That's not what we're going to do. But just a reminder here, just to wrap this subject up. Yes, generally speaking, there are, it's, uh, for more minor offenses and therefore with more minor penalties attached to it. But why now does this statute result in a felony charge with harsher penalties? And the answer, as we all know, is because Trump campaigned on that in 2016 because he thought he was going to be able to sentence Hillary Clinton to prison for these things. And instead, he got caught up in the same exact snare because, of course, all Republican accusations are confessions. We should have guessed right from the outset that he would be caught under this law. 
And he, with no regard whatsoever for whether or not it was a good idea to increase penalties for a strict liability crime, because I'll never be caught for it because of how awesome I am and or... Uh, yes, I do intend to commit this crime, but I will sick the mob on people and convince them that it's not worth charging me because it'll be so terrible with the mob running around ransacking houses or maybe the Capitol building or taking over the airports and ramming the ramparts or whatever that I'll get away with it. But irony being what it is, uh, this uh, increased penalty for this strict liability crime, which legal theorists might have told you was a bad idea from the outset, you blew right past them and signed it anyway. And now this is what they call being hoist by your own petard. So, okay, we all know what that means, I think. I don't really know. And it's one of the few uh, uh, stupid phrases out there that invoke the name of uh, ancient uh, war machine uh, that uh, you'd have to look up and find out exactly what the thing does. But uh, that's, the, that's the only use for petards anymore these days, to hoist oneself by them. Um, you might as well. They're sitting in disuse and not hoisting anything these days. If you're interested in enough to restore to working order an ancient petard, then... Uh, that you should expect that that's what's going to happen to you. Anyway, back to Digby. Had to get out of the petard thing. Uh, her very interesting approach to things. Enough politics before law. The U.S. must abandon presidential privilege and prosecute Donald Trump. Subheader. Americans wanted to get over Watergate by letting Richard Nixon slink away quietly. Trump will do no such thing. Of course, he's, she's entirely right. Uh, Nixon was mm, certainly relatively... Uh, prepared to go more quietly, though he kept giving interviews and saying, well, when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. So he never really gave up, but uh, he's not in the league of Donald Trump in terms of loudmouth-ism. The uh, body of the article, when President Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon in 1974, many Americans were appalled. Uh, friends of Jared and Ivanka privately said that they were appalled as well. In fact, it's widely assumed to have been a decisive factor in Ford's 1976 loss to Jimmy Carter. Still, there was a general sense of relief among the public that the Watergate saga was over. Ford had wanted Nixon to show contrition as a condition of the pardon, but the disgraced former president refused. Ford issued the pardon anyway, because why not, I guess, in his mind. I've already made a big to-do about it. I've already taken the hit for floating it. Might as well do it. Uh, absolving him of all crimes committed while he was president. Nixon did eventually issue a fairly gracious acknowledgement after he received the pardon. It's the closest thing to an apology Richard Nixon ever gave to the country, and it's quoted here. I was wrong in not acting more decisively and forthrightly in dealing with Watergate, particularly when it reached the stage of judicial proceedings and grew from a political scandal into a national tragedy. No words. Should I even be attempting? I don't know if I can do a Nixon voice. Anyway, no words can describe, maybe, that won't work, the depth of my regret and pain and the anguish my mistakes over Watergate have caused the nation and the presidency, a nation I so deeply love and an institution I so greatly respect. Gargle bargle. Okay. Richard Nixon had made many political comebacks in his career, but at this point it was all over. He had resigned in disgrace and the country could move on, at least secure in the knowledge that he would never hold public office again. There would be no more comebacks, although, I mean, he certainly could have, right? That might have been one of the reasons to impeach him, to bar him from future federal office. But back in those days, it was just expected. He'll just go away. The notion that it is wrong to prosecute former presidents for what they did while in office may have been around before all of that happened, but it really seemed to take hold with Nixon. Many people were upset, of course, but the argument that there was something destabilizing about a new administration prosecuting its predecessor and having the taint of banana republic politics was pretty compelling. The shame and humiliation of a tarnished legacy were believed to be powerful deterrents to the kind of people who would seek the highest office in the nation. The, ug the ugliness of putting a former leader on trial and potentially in jail would change American politics forever, and it made a whole lot of people feel queasy. It's pretty clear today that that was a mistake. 
It may have once been okay to allow a disgraced president to resign and live in solitary obscurity to contemplate his crimes. The acute danger to the country was over, after all. The presidency was peacefully transferred, and Congress enacted many reforms to deal with the future presidential overreach. But those arguments do not apply to our current crisis. Donald Trump simply won't stop committing crimes and is determined to keep doing it as long as he can get away with it. Just try to imagine him putting out a statement like Nixon's. Jack Goldsmith, who uh, Greg brought up a little earlier, former head of the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, wrote a piece for Lawfare this week in which he discusses this subject. He has long been one of those opposed to prosecuting former presidents for all the reasons I outline above, but has reluctantly come to the conclusion that this situation may require it. Oh, okay, that may be different than we thought. Donald Trump, although who knows whether we're just reading him more hopefully. Donald Trump is unlike any president in American history. That seems true. Goldsmith was moved to write about this in the context of Trump's latest scandal, his inexplicable decision to illegally abscond with White House documents intended for the National Archives, some of which we now know were highly classified and which he refused to return. We may never know the contents of those documents, but we do know that a grand jury has been hearing testimony about this issue for months and that the head of counterintelligence division at the FBI was alarmed enough to apply for a search warrant, citing laws governing obstruction of justice, removal or destruction of records and violation of the Espionage Act. And by the way, was concerned enough to uh, uh, actually accompany FBI uh, officers on that raid. Goldsmith believes that whatever, uh, that whether this was a wise move by the DOJ depends on the contents of the documents and whether it is proven that Trump refused to cooperate. I think he's missing the forest for the trees. And of course, he's leaving out the strict liability issue as well. But OK, uh, it may turn out that the documents are not as sensitive as they thought. And all that will happen is that they are returned to the National Archives. You have to look at this in the context of Trump's years-long crime spree to see that they had no choice but to take this extraordinary step. His contempt for the rule of law is so brazen that if they didn't, we might as well just officially declare that he has blanket immunity from criminal prosecution in perpetuity and call it a day. Consider the long list of crimes that the Justice Department was precluded from prosecuting because of the policy against prosecuting a sitting president. The Mueller report alone listed among uh, almost a dozen instances of obstruction of justice just in the first two years of Trump's presidency. He tried to bribe a foreign leader for personal political gain and was impeached for doing it. His abuse of presidential power to punish enemies and reward cronies is unprecedented. As we speak, he is under investigation for attempting a coup and disrupting the peaceful transfer of power. And he's running for president again with the full backing of tens of millions of loyal followers who are convinced that Trump is being persecuted simply for being their hero. Trump has slithered out from under the law and managed to evade accountability for his misdeeds his entire life. He has been committing crimes and dealing in corrupt practices at an ever-increasing pace since he entered politics, believing that it shields him from legal liability. That is, that he has entered politics. In fact, he believes that being president allows him to literally do anything he chooses. So everyone is rightfully worried about what will happen if Trump is held accountable for his crimes. After all, he has already unleashed his violent supporters on the FBI, and he's saying publicly that something terrible is going to happen because of his supposed persecution. His cult-like following is talking about civil war. But part of the reason he has all those followers in the first place is that he seems to be invulnerable. They see him as a superhero, still standing after all the slings and arrows dished out by the legal authorities and the political opposition. It's just possible that if the rule of law prevails for once, the veil might fall and some of them will see him as the frail narcissist he really is. Let's just say it's worth a try. It's not like letting him off the hook has worked up until now. That's true. Uh, there's much more to say about that. But uh, for instance, uh, I, yeah, I think uh, actually uh, arrested, tried and convicted and being photographed in the orange jumpsuit with no makeup and without his regular regimen 
and all of his people around him. He will look pretty pathetic by the end. And that might, that alone might change some minds. And just seeing him prosecuted and finding out that, yeah, this was a real crime. And yeah, 70% of the country actually thinks it's the right thing to do to prosecute him for it might be enough. Of course, you know, there's a different methodology that has the, um, or has in the past had the effect of dissuading people, even who uh, weren't necessarily in support of the person at the apex of power at the time, but who were convinced that he was untouchable and invulnerable. Uh, in Romania, the Ceausescu's, I'm sure, gave that impression even to people who hated him with a passion. Just nothing ever touched him. But then the machine-gunned bodies of uh, Nikolai and Elena Ceausescu viewed in the courtyard of the uh, of the court's building right after their execution changed minds forever about what it really meant to be a uh, central Euro an eastern european communist dictator you're not invulnerable after all hi i'm scott anderson the guy that writes the daily summary for this show k grow in the morning thank you to everyone that supports this show Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. All right, welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, yeah, okay, I think, well, we are done with uh, Digby's article. There was one point that I blew right past so that I could finish the article that I wanted to return to. But uh, just to hammer this thing home one more time, there was the passage wherein uh, she wrote uh, his contempt, that is Trump's contempt for the rule of law is so brazen that if they didn't, that is, go ahead and uh, uh, search the home and get prepared to prosecute him for uh, the crime of having removed these documents, that we might as well just officially declare that he has blanket immunity from criminal prosecution in perpetuity and call it a day. Just to bring that back to the other earlier concept, if you can't convict a guy uh, against whom you have prima facie evidence that is evident on its face of uh, evidence that on its face uh, seals the deal in a strict liability crime, then what the hell is there out there? How is a president or ex-president not above the law if the law says it doesn't matter why you have them, it doesn't matter how you got them even, but if you have them, you can be charged. I guess it does matter how you got them. If they can prove, for instance, that he was right about them, you know, and he wasn't just lying out of his ass, which is what he was doing. If you could actually establish that they had been planted, I suppose then, then you wouldn't be held liable for this. But a strict liability crime that says all that's necessary is that you be in possession of these things and that there be no other, let's say, mitigating factors, but the state of mind doesn't matter. Take all of that out. He, we went to his house. We looked around. We found boxes of stuff that the law says, if you've got it and you're not supposed to, and he wasn't supposed to, then you're guilty and you still won't charge the guy, then there's nothing left. Then, yes, ex-presidents are above the law. And that's why uh, this choice of statute was so important. You know, maybe... Uh, um, Maybe that was part of the plan, too, right? Uh, I guess if you really wanted to credit Merrick Garland with being a mastermind here, and I'm not certain that I do, but if you wanted to, there are people who do, you could say uh, what he was waiting for was, and it was a strong possibility that they would get to it, 
But what he was waiting for was the opportunity to go after Trump on a strict liability crime. And in you know the added twist of the fact that he had made it a felony and had raised the penalties on it. But he wanted to get his foot in the door with the strict liability crime. And then you can go ahead and prosecute all the rest of them that actually do require perhaps the establishment of a mens rea and prove what his intent was and what his state of mind was. But you're already in court. Fine, go ahead. And if you get a criminal conviction on um, the Espionage Act, well, that might just crack open the door and uh, uh, convince people that maybe it was worth uh, prosecuting them on some other things as well. So it's not just the fact that the fun name is there, the Espionage Act, which, as others have pointed out, and I think we at least gave some credence to their claims, it doesn't necessarily mean they keep saying it's a misnomer. And uh, in fact, the section that they're talking about here uh, doesn't necessarily have to involve any spying. But the reason it's the Espionage Act, the reason they call it that, is it has something, I think, to do with the strict liability standard of the statute. If you steal or come into possession or intentionally come into possession of this material, there's very little that you could be doing it with it that is not espionage. You could be showing it to friends and bragging on it, but it's so sensitive, it's not supposed to be shown to anyone. And you, especially a raging idiot and narcissist like Donald Trump, who's ensconced himself in the Pervalago Palace that's full of spies itself. If you live in a palace of spies, but you're not a spy, but you seek the approval of spies by showing off and showing sensitive materials to them in the hopes that they'll think you're really cool, you're a spy. I mean, you might not know it, but you're committing espionage. That's true. That's just, you know, and if we can't prove that you intended to do it, that doesn't get anybody anywhere. We need to be able to stop people who are stupid from showing off classified material to people who are spies. And that's why it's a strict liability crime. Anyway, so perhaps the genius of Merrick Garland there is to say, all right, we can prosecute them for anything we want so long as we get them dead to rights on something. Let's lead with that something. Oh, here's a strict liability crime that he's actually, believe it or not, bragging about having committed. Let's go in on this one. I don't know whether that's the plan or not, but it's certainly plausible. And uh, back to Digby's point here. Yeah, if you can't prosecute on a strict liability crime, you can't prosecute on anything. So, okay. I think we're done with that. Let me head back to Pocket. There's about 10,000 other things I wanted to share with you. Um, one of them was uh, over on the other, you know, in the other uh, area where Trump is having legal problems. Um, News from, let's see, the New York Daily News has something. Rolling Stone had some uh, write up on it. They both were early uh, out with the news that Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg uh, essentially has flipped and will be testifying against the Trump Organization as part of his plea deal. That's the headline on the New York Daily News. Rolling Stone with a little more detail here. Uh, going with the headline of Trump's CFO, Alan Weisselberg, will implicate Trump companies in guilty plea. So he flipped and something I've been waiting for for a long time. And I'm glad I was able to dig up an example of it. But back in the day, one of the elections, one of the recent elections, uh, I think it was the DLCC, the Democratic Legislative Campaign Council, doing the state legislative races and maybe even the governor's races at the DS. What is it? Uh, DGA, uh, Democratic Governors Association. Like, anyway, uh, but they had these nice graphics that they were using. Anytime a legislative seat that they were working on flipped when a Democrat captured a previously Republican seat, they had the graphic that would put the person's face up and identify who they are and where they were running. And they had this, you know, crazy graphic uh, GIF of the word flipped over and over again, changing from red to blue and flipping upside down and backwards and flashing in the background. It was quite annoying and maybe even seizure inducing. But I've been thinking ever since it would be great to have that ready. I wish I had better graphic skills. I could have been ready for it. But uh, Greg bailed me out and a couple of others uh, who came to the rescue with different versions of it. But I thought it would be great to have an Alan Weisselberg uh, face in the middle of that with the flipped <laughs> flashing in the back. That's what happened. Let's read the Daily News version of it because it's likely to be perhaps a little bit more brutal. Uh, Rolling Stone will have perhaps more detail. 
I also liked that. I went looking for a picture of Weisselberg to put in that graphic of him, you know, smiling and giving a, a headshot like the uh, politicians who are in them often do. But Greg went with, and now I, I think I appreciate that even more, the picture of him that accompanies this article, which is one, wearing a mask for, you know, COVID protection, and two, with the downcast eyes and hanging his head in shame. I think I like that a bit more, too. So where were we? Ah, uh, yes, Daily News. Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg will testify against the company if called as a witness, according to sources. Uh, Molly Crane Newman is the writer for this piece. The Trump Organization's longtime chief financial officer is expected to admit to conspiring with the Trump Organization and Trump Payroll Corporation in a criminal tax fraud scheme while head of the company's finances at a Manhattan court hearing on Thursday. The Daily News has confirmed. Alan Weisselberg is expected to criminally implicate Trump's family real estate business when he pleads guilty to felony tax fraud charges. And I think that's supposed to be happening today. A source familiar with the matter told the news on Wednesday. Uh, also interesting here, the invocation of the name of the Trump Payroll Corporation. Do you remember that? It's been a long time since we discussed it, but it was that long uh, and detailed New York Times expose. Uh, I don't remember, maybe 2019 something uh, in that neighborhood, maybe 2018, detailing, uh, well, all the uh, uh, detail, I think, came out of, a lot of it came from tips from Mary Trump, as I recall, uh, but just detailing the weird and intricate tax avoidance scheme that they set up and uh, allowed people to be paid in wacky and strange and I guess possibly illegal ways. Uh, so that that is at the center of this litigation, this criminal charge is exciting news. As part of the CFO's plea deal, for which he'll serve five months max, on Rikers Island, that's not bad, the sources said Weisselberg is expected to agree to testify against the Trump companies if they choose to go to trial in October, and he's called as a witness. Former President Donald Trump has not been named as a defendant in the Manhattan District Attorney's case, which stems from a broader probe into his business practices. Weisselberg's plea agreement, uh, whose terms were being finalized on Wednesday, contains no provision relating to cooperating against Trump, nor anybody with the last name Trump, the source said. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, why not? Weisselberg, 75, who once referred to himself as Donald Trump's eyes and ears, refused to flip on his ex-boss for almost a year as the DA investigated his business practices. Prosecutors indicted the CFO on felony tax fraud charges after it became clear he wouldn't cooperate. A 15-count indictment that a grand jury returned against Weisselberg in June of 2021 accuses him of dodging income tax on more than $1.7 million in lavish fringe benefits. That included private school tuition for his grandchildren, sleepaway camp fees, luxury car rentals, and a rent-free apartment overlooking Central Park for his son Barry Weisselberg's young family from 2005 to 2011, prosecutors allege. And I think I also recall that Barry's ex-wife uh, was apparently uh, disgruntled enough by the collapse of their marriage, as I recall. Maybe I have it wrong, but uh, she also, I think, was a key witness in this. Much of the evidence investigators obtained against the Trump accountant came from his estranged daughter-in-law, Jennifer. There we go. Who provided the DA with a caseload of documents from her divorce by order of grand jury subpoena in April of 2021. Her husband, ex-husband, Barry Weisselberg, also worked for the Trump Organization, managing its cash-only ice rink and carousel in Central Park for almost two decades. I had absolutely no idea that they were criminals. I would not have married Barry at all, she told the news after handing over the records. Weisselberg is expected to admit to his alleged crimes before State Supreme Court Justice Juan Merchan on Thursday. Uh, this could, uh, that could have potentially calamitous implications for the Trump family's real estate business. If this is true, it's a devastating blow to the Trump organization. Well, we'll find out today said Daniel Alonso, a white-collar defense lawyer and former deputy to the former Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance Jr., who launched the office's Trump probe. No thanks to him. Anyway, it would make a relatively easy, to easy case to prove if you have a high managerial agent on the stand saying, I'm guilty. 
That's enormously helpful to the prosecution. Yeah, I guess so. Trump could still be charged in the investigation. Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg, who nobody's really thrilled with, but maybe he'll turn out to be a secret genius like Merrick Garland, who inherited the probe when he took office on January 1st, has said he will announce his decision on whether to indict the former president when he makes up his mind. Well, that would be the time. Trump Organization lawyers Alan Futterfuss and Suzanne Nichelis, I don't think we've heard of her yet, did not respond to requests for seek, uh, seeking comment, nor did a company spokeswoman. Weisselberg's lawyer, Nicholas Gravante, declined comment. His lawyer, Mary Mulligan, could not be reached. Manhattan DA spokeswoman, Danielle Filson, declined to comment. I should just uh, dismiss reading all of the, those last paragraphs of all the people, the names of all the people who didn't comment in the story. But I guess in the interest of full disclosure, they want everybody to know that they tried to get those people to comment, then they just wouldn't. Rolling Stone has an article on this too. It might be worth taking a quick look at their version of it if it's not behind a paywall and seeing if there's any more detail. Uh, Victoria Bekempis, I'm guessing at the uh, pronunciation of her last name. And uh, let's see, Alan Weisselberg, the Trump Organization's chief uh, finance chief, will say in Manhattan court Thursday, today, that he conspired with several of the ex-president's companies when he pleads guilty to state tax crimes, two sources tell Rolling Stone. As part of Weisselberg's plea deal, he has agreed to testify against the Trump Corporation and the Trump Payroll Corporation at trial, scheduled for October. So we'll find out whether they actually go to trial uh, a little later. If called to the witness stand during trial, Weisselberg will provide testimony that is the same as what he admits to in court this week, the source said. One of the sources said that while Weisselberg is agreeing to testify, that does not necessarily mean he will. It depends on whether prosecutors decide to call him. The New York Times first reported that Weisselberg was expected to plead guilty, and CNN reported that he would testify if called. Weisselberg will not go beyond his testimony to help the criminal probe, one of the sources said. Still, his potential testimony could pose a severe threat to Trump's companies. This possible testimony, which allegedly implicates Trump's businesses, could be key to prosecutors securing a guilty verdict against those companies. When a company is found to have engaged in criminal conduct, significant fines can pile up quickly, potentially leading to its demise. Weisselberg's expected guilty plea stems from an indictment last year from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office accusing him and several of the Trump companies of tax crimes in a sweeping and audacious illegal payment scheme. Ooh, everything's jumping all over the place because of pop-up ads. The, these financial offenses related to the lavish perks that came with being CFO of Donald Trump's real estate empire. Uh, the Trump Organization has maintained its not guilty plea, so his namesake business and several related entities remain under indictment. Starting in 2005, Weisselberg, a Trump family employee of some five decades, lived gratis in an apartment on Manhattan's Riverside Boulevard. The Trump Corporation, which leased the apartment, was covering his rent, along with Weisselberg's utility and parking fees, the indictment charged. The Trump Organization also made sure his longtime money man rode in style from 2005 to 2017. The ex-president's company paid the leases on two Mercedes Benzes that Weisselberg and his wife used as their personal cars. Trump's company gave Weisselberg cash around Christmas time so he could, quote, uh, could pay, quote, personal holiday gratuities, prosecutors alleged. Hmm. Weisselberg's family was also well taken care of, prosecutors said. The company covered Weisselberg's personal expenses for his homes and for an apartment maintained by one of his children, according to the indictment. Among the requests were items such as new beds, flat screen televisions, the installation of carpeting, and furniture for Weisselberg's home in Florida. Like, you know, he's pretty wealthy. He could just buy his own stuff. Weisselberg's grandchildren benefited from this arrangement, too, with the Trump Corporation footing the bill for private school tuition per the charging papers. Prosecutors alleged that Weisselberg didn't declare these benefits on his taxes, meaning he purportedly received $1.7 million in unlawful payments. A lawyer for the Trump companies declined to comment, got all of that. Everybody else declined to comment. Speaking generally about how Weisselberg's guilty plea could impact Trump, Rebecca Roife, I guess, R-O-I-P-H-E, New York Law School professor, tells Rolling Stone, it is another Trump person being convicted of something, and it also reflects on him more than just the company he keeps. This is obviously conduct that occurred separately from his presidency and has to do with how he conducted his businesses. Whether or not he was directly involved in these actions or knew about them or was criminally liable for them, it's serious and significant. Okay. 
Well, all right. I think there's probably, there's a little bit more here, but it looks to me in my quick scan like we won't learn a great deal more about this case. Just uh, exciting to see the news that uh, someone close to Trump is in extra trouble. All right. Oh, and thank you. Uh, we'll add this note. Judy Vincent sends me uh, a Wikipedia listing about petards, or rather the actual saying, hoist with his own petard. And I thought it was hoist by rather than with, but uh, apparently a phrase uh, from a speech in William Shakespeare's play Hamlet, perhaps you've heard of it, that has become proverbial. Only Shakespeare could have put this saying together, I guess. The phrase's meaning is that a bomb maker is lifted, that is, hoist off the ground with his own bomb, a petard. The petard is a small explosive device itself and indicates an ironic reversal or poetic justice. So, okay, that's good. That's good for clarifying. And that's why it's with rather than by. The petard isn't the hoisting device. It's the bomb that the hoist, whatever that's called, was lifting and I guess getting ready to swing over or toss into uh, presumably a, a fortified castle or of some kind. And if you are a hoist with that petard, then you are next to an explosive device, which presumably is lit and set to go off. Uh, certainly a dangerous situation. The phrase occurs in a central speech in the play, in case you've forgotten, in which Hamlet has discovered a plot on his life by Claudius and resolves to respond to it by letting the plotter be hoist with his own petard. Although the now proverbial phrase is best known as part of the speech, it and the later sea voyage and pirate attack are central to critical arguments regarding the play. All right. Well, we don't need to go on with that, but uh, I'll uh, point you to it and you can read all about it. Thank you, Judy, for providing us with that important context and straightening it out. And maybe now I'll remember it correctly. Hoist with his own petard, not using the petard to hoist them, but hoisting someone on something else along with a petard. Okay, important and good to know. All right, let's see. Other things to share with you in the last 10 minutes of the show. Gosh, there are so many. How about I pull out this one from Rebecca Sager at Daily Coast, uh, updating us on, uh, because we've been talking a lot about what happened in Wyoming with Liz Cheney. What about some information about just how loony the woman who unseated her is? Uh, it is Harriet Hageman. And, uh, well, uh, there's a, uh, a brilliant promise in this headline. Wait till you learn about the woman who unseated Liz Cheney. She's a hot mess in the worst sense. All right, Rebecca, let's hear it. It's important to know who might be uh, rolling into that seat. Tuesday, Representative Liz Cheney, a fourth generation Wyomingite, lost her congressional seat in Wyoming to Harriet Hageman, an attorney reviled for unrelenting attacks on the environment who has most recently been seen offering rage-inducing and boggling comments about President Joe Biden. No surprise there. Although not much is really known about the Republican congressional nominee, she worked for several decades as a trial attorney battling for private interests against environmental policies, the New York Times reports, fighting against the protection of everything from land to water to endangered species to millions of acres of national forests. Hageman is a real winner in the era of a planet that in many regions is literally burning to the ground. Well, that's interesting. A planet burning to the ground. It is the ground, but okay. Uh, hoist with by, you get the point. You get some poetic license in that. But in her comments just days ago on Steve Bannon's podcast, Real America's Voice, great name. We should just Tell, change our name to that. Hageman implied that fentanyl overdoses were Biden's fault somehow. Okay, calling the president the largest or the most destructive human trafficker in our history. Are you following me? Me neither. Okay, all right, so she's a little bit uh, loony. That's probably true. And embedded here is a tweet from the Republican Accountability Project. Uh, with uh, video, I guess, of those statements. It's no surprise that Hageman, 59, hates Biden. She was endorsed by former President Trump on September 9th and believes he lost the 2020 election because of fraud. We have serious questions about the 2020 election, Hageman said during a debate on June 30th and in a statement sent to Business Insider, Hageman wrote, 
We didn't elect her to Congress to wage her personal war with President Trump. The people of this state want their only member of Congress to reflect their views and values, and they're going to fire Liz Cheney. I mean, here there's a warning, I think, for the idea that, oh, well, Liz Cheney just wants to get on the debate stage with Donald Trump and take him apart during the presidential primaries in 2024. It's not necessarily the case that she wants to go all, I mean, I'm sure she'd take it, but she's not necessarily in it to win it, but just to make sure that people know what a monster Donald Trump is. But there are several problems with that, uh, starting with, I guess we should start with, the fact that for primary debates, the RNC will set the rules for qualification and they'll just write a rule that says Liz Cheney doesn't qualify and then she won't be on the debate stage. But if they let her on there, I mean, we also have this. She debated Hageman and had a, you know, a one-on-one uh, with the one of the Trumpiest of the Trumpy out there and uh, didn't convince uh, Wyoming Republicans to return her to office. So... Who knows? I mean, you know, you, you, you'd like to think that a, a lunatic like Hageman would be taken apart by someone like uh, Cheney, but I guess sometimes it just doesn't matter. It might have played well on TV to us, but not to them in Wyoming among Republicans. Anyway, NPR reports that about 70 percent of Wyoming voted for Trump in 2020 and that it was Cheney's unwavering devotion to her position on the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol, the full name, that infuriated her constituency and ultimately what lost her the seat on Tuesday. Before announcing her run, it was clear Hageman was going to attack Cheney for voting to impeach Trump after the January 6th insurrection. The people of Wyoming deserve leaders who reflect their views and values. But Liz Cheney betrayed us because of her personal war with President Trump, who won Wyoming by massive majorities twice, Hageman said. Hageman's position on January 6th is clear. She has regularly pivoted away from what she's called the J6 situation and instead prefers to stump on the gas crisis, which isn't happening anymore, and the cost of food, which in the form of chicken wings is coming down anyway. Hageman's no stranger to politics. Her father, Jim Hageman, was a state representative in Wyoming for more than 20 years. In 2018, she ran for governor, finishing third in the primary. The irony is that Cheney and Hageman are eerily similar. Yeah, that's worth pointing out. As Insider reports, Cheney voted with Trump 93% of the time while he, she was in office, or while he was in office. Both women agree on protecting oil over the environment, and both oppose the expansion of the government. In fact, Hageman served as an advisor during Cheney's Senate run in 2014, and Hageman endorsed her congressional bid in 2016. They part ways only when it comes to Trump. In Cheney's concession speech, she pledged to do, quote, whatever it takes to make sure Trump stays out of the White House. Two years ago, I won this primary with 73% of the votes. I could easily have done the same thing again. The path was clear, but it would have required that I go along with President Trump's lie about the 2020 election, Cheney said. And uh, that brings us to the end of the piece. So, you know, actually, uh, there's there's far worse, I think, that will come out about uh, Hageman, although in all likelihood it won't make much of a difference in a race in Wyoming. But I wanted to open the door to exploring that. Let me see. Uh, I guess we only have just a, a few minutes left. Uh, I did want to get back to uh, Bethesda 1971-slash-Bosengoods um, uh, discussion of the time we ended up, thanks to Trump's blabbermouth, having to extract a top spy from Russia and connect that with everything that's going on, including his being, oh, I don't know, charged under the Espionage Act. Doesn't necessarily mean he's a spy, but he does end up, weirdly, in the realm of espionage quite frequently. But instead... Maybe I'll throw you this one, also from Insider, or the Business Insider, uh, this time. But uh, just to add fuel to the fire about this strict liability crime and the other people who committed it, this headline, former Homeland Security Advisor for Mike Pence, you'll remember who she is when I give you the name in a minute, said she once, quote, found classified documents in the ladies' room. Hmm. They're not taking care of those documents, even when they were in the White House. It's Olivia Troy, uh, former Homeland Security Advisor to Mike Pence, of course, speaking with MSNBC. And, uh, well, let's see, should we do the bullet points? I guess so, because we're 
running low on time here. A former White House advisor said she once found classified documents, quote, in the ladies' room. That's not where they belong. Olivia Troy was Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor to Pence. Her comments come days after the FBI raided Mar-a-Lago and seized boxes of classified documents. Anything we can glean from the body of the article before it's time to go? Uh, I found classified information in the ladies' room of the White House one time in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, Troy said, which is different structure, but it's part of the White House complex. I was not expecting to walk into the ladies' room and find a document like that. Her comments came right after the raid, of course. Troy told Insider that she found the documents on a shelf in the bathroom sometime before the pandemic, in case you were wondering about the timing of this stuff. And she thought that was odd that someone put them down and forgot them. But I guess if people are forgetting their guns there, they might uh, frequently forget classified documents as well. On MSNBC, she said she immediately reported the classified documents to security, but said that it would concern anyone with a security clearance. I remember the panic, Troy said. There is a sort of a blood pressure rise in you where you pick it up and you're like, oh, what do I do with this? I have a responsibility to protect it. Yes, now you're in possession of it, right? And it could be a strict liability crime if you're not entitled to have the document, but I suppose they'd give you a path, pass if you found it and said, I better turn this into some national security people. But luckily she had that clearance, I guess, luckily. Uh, she should never have had it because she was associated with Mike Pence, who should never have had it. But anyway, Troy added that it was a known thing that her colleagues did not properly handle documents. People would carry documents around, especially political appointees, and traditionally you would put it in a pouch and you would secure it and you would lock the pouch and then carry it, Troy said. Well, that's not what was the norm in the White House, and I do think there were numerous situations where you could see this kind of behavior. Reports of the FBI raid said that federal agents believe Trump had presidential records, which are officially government property. And of course, uh, the report that they were looking for documents describing U.S. nuclear weapons. For those of us that have clearances, again, you do have a responsibility to protect the information, Troy said. You don't carry it home and store it for whatever number of months in an unclassified facility. Well, uh, yeah, that's probably true. And I'll give you one more comment after this brief break. From NetworksRadio.com, you have been listening to Kegro in the Morning with David Waldman. She basically reiterates the strict liability point, saying it doesn't matter what it says, what it actually contains. The bottom line is that information is stored and should be carried cared for, carried properly, and secured because it could put lives at risk if that information gets into the wrong hands. Well, guess what? The right hands have the information now. Justice Putnam is next.